everyone. Happy Sabbath and um, welcome to this evening's study. Just a reminder for the time change that's going to happen here in the middle of the night, uh, early Sunday morning, I guess it would be. I think it's two o'clock. We're going to turn the clock back an hour and relive that hour. Um, so for those that have changed their time last week, last weekend, or those that don't have a time change, just keep that in mind that our time is changing back to mountain daylight time. So I thought I'd put it here at the well, beginning. So that won't, but it will affect the Sunday morning study, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, text is a bit wide. Um, I'm not sure. On my screen, it looks fine on my screen where I'm sharing it. So what do you mean the text is wide? Uh, just be better if there was a, a bigger column on the left. Oh, okay. Why is that? It's easier to fit stuff on the screen. Oh, because you put stuff on your screen. Okay. Okay, so um, anyway, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and uh, for the challenges of this past week. We know, Lord, that we depend upon you um, when things are challenging, even though we should always depend upon you at all times. Um, but we are reminded of our need of you. And so we ask, Lord, that you can take over our lives, that we can cooperate with you in the work that you are doing upon our hearts and the hearts of those around us. And uh, we pray for forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that we can trust in your righteousness and not in our own. We pray for each person, um, for our families, our friends, those that we have in con come in contact with on a daily basis that your angels can watch over them, and that your Holy Spirit can speak to their hearts. And we pray, Lord, for this study here uh, this evening as we continue to look at the issues regarding 1888, the history of that, and um, that you can give us uh, a correct understanding, that we can spend time studying these things on our own, and we can know what is truth and that we can learn the lessons of the past. So we invite your spirit here into our hearts, into this study, and we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so last week we we read this by Robert Olson, um, this article. Uh, this is uh, from the E.G. White Disc. And it is, I'm just going to make this a little bigger. So on the E.G. White disc, it's, it's got this section uh, called Ellen White Estate Research Documents, right? It happens to be uh, the second one. This one's on the sanctuary. And then this one here did the... 1888 session yield good for the church or bad and so we were reading through this and we got to the seven lessons for today and 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 i was thinking well do we need to go through these but after reading through them i think there are some really important uh, points that are made here so i want to go through that um i do have some other things that i want to look at so this one won't take us very long uh the other thing that i want to look at is a ministry magazine article from February of 1888, and it's a review of the book 1888 Reexamined, which is by Wieland and Short. So Robert J. Wieland and Donald K. Short. And um, uh, that book, um, I've had different copies of it in the past. I've, I've read it. There's some things I don't agree with in the book, but uh, overall, I think the book is uh, a good book to read. Um, so I want to want to show you what they say about the book, which actually I thought was quite good. 
Now, um, so we're going to look at that and then whether we, how much we want to look at 1880 re-exam. So the one thing is, I mean, we can't go through all of these books together. It's a lot of information and people are going to have to do some of their own reading. So all I can really do is kind of point us uh, to some things to study on our own. Uh, I do want to look at, um, which I have done before, we've looked at uh, the two books on Galatians, but it never hurts to look at those again. So that's uh, G.I. Butler's book on Galatians and E.J. E. Wagner's response. Uh, G. Wagner. Yeah. <clears throat> so looking at his response. So E.J. Wagner. Um, and uh, so anyway, we're going to look at this first. And so you remember what he was doing is he was going through uh, basically an evaluation of uh, like the good and the bad, the positive and the negative um, things that happened in 1888. I mean, his perspective is not exactly the same as mine, but it's definitely leaning more towards what I would think about 1888 than what uh, most Adventists would think of today. <clears throat> so he says, we must not end with a narration of the evils and the virtues of the Minneapolis meeting. We need to learn important lessons from the experience of our forefathers. These lessons need to be pointed out, meditated upon, and acted upon, or we will be in danger of repeating the mistakes they made a century ago. So this, is, of course, is one of the things that happens when we, we go back and study our history. I mean, it's important to know that history cor correctly, what things they did right, what things they did wrong, how God led them. And we see a parallel and much more than what most people would with the past and the present. That is, we see that there's a prophetic parallel that is uh, represented in the scriptures and rep represented in the events and the dates and so forth that are symbolic, that help us to understand what's happening in the present. Because part of our problem is that there are many winds of doctrine. There's many different views. And what can we use to help us in sorting through truth from error? Now, God, of course, has given us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can speak to us individually. But often, at least in my own experience, there's many things of that we experience that we're uncertain about. That is... We can look at ourselves and we can say, am I just taking this position or this view or am I having this belief based upon my own subjective feelings? Or is this something that's founded in God's word? And so we need to know how to study the Bible. And the method that has been given for us in the last days is Miller's Rules that are expanded upon in the principle of line upon line. That is, we look back at the past history and see the parallels, and this gives us guidance. Now, for some people, this may be a difficult idea in that, well, you know, we just need God's word. We just need to read it and do what it says and believe the doctrines that it teaches. That is, and that is true, that is, God's word is plain. We, we're not, we can't add to it. That is, there's not some hidden meaning in God's word that contradicts the plain and obvious meaning, right? The doctrines of the Bible are plain. We, we can agree with that, right? That, that to understand the, the Bible, anyone can understand it who seeks to understand truth. And so the question is, well, why do we have all of these other things, right, that we look upon, that we look at? It's only yeah. gray, there's only gray areas in Scripture because of us. Okay, so you bring up the point. The gray exists because of sin. And yeah. God has given us the stories of the past in the Bible, but also sacred history, the story of his church. And these are also lessons. They, they can't supersede 
the scriptures in the sense for doctrine. You know, we're not going to uh, determine a doctrine based upon looking at the repeat of history. But we are going to see things that help us to understand the behavior and the actions around us, plus our own behavior. So we can we can learn from the past and we can see in ourselves things that need to be corrected. For me personally, back when I was a very young man, you know, my early 20s, and I became an Adventist, I was baptized when I was 19, just uh, you know, a month or so before I turned 20. And um, you know, I started studying Seventh-day Adventism. And I had to sort out what was true and what was false. And, and God's spirit showed me, showed me my sin. And, um, but I had dangers that were there. And uh, when I would read the spirit of prophecy, the testimonies, I would see in, in, in the councils that she wrote to others, things that I found to be dangerous for me personally. And um also found in uh, reading about A.T. Jones, for instance, that there were dangers that he had, even though he believed in the truth of righteousness by faith, that there was dangers that he faced. Some of those have to do with our perception of ourselves. And so the one thing I've always been cautious about is how I perceive myself, because I can perceive myself as good when I'm not. I can see perceive myself as correct when I'm not. Like nobody ever thinks that they're wrong about something because if they were, they would change their mind and be correct, right? That would be logical anyway. Um, so once we have a view or an opinion or an idea um, and we've settled on that idea, uh, we've settled on it because we believe it to be correct. And so sometimes it's hard to be correct. And, and so I took at what happened with Jones and with Wagner, dangers that lie uh, at our feet, the snares um, of thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. And I think that happened to Jones and Wagner. It's a danger when somebody is placed in a position where God has given them light. And, you know, it's, it's obvious that God gave Jones and Wagner a lot light. And then you depend upon that rather than upon God himself. The fact that you receive light now in some ways you know, sort of special. So in my own personal experience, I found that to be very helpful. Just because I, I believe something to be true uh, doesn't mean I should uh, think that I'm better than other people. And uh, it doesn't mean that I, I can't be corrected. So we always seek to be corrected. And we are corrected by God's word. But also, people can present God's word to us in a way that we haven't seen before. And we need to look at that. So, so we have all of this, this past history. And that is part of what God uses to correct us. So we can't just, you know, study the Bible and forget about sacred history. We need to know our history. We need to know what stumbling blocks exist for Adventism. Uh, where the church has gone astray. And, and we need to correct those things in ourselves first. Uh, to expect the church to correct it when they've gone astray as an organization or anything is, is rather foolish. And to expect that somehow we have to get the church to repent, which is a problem that I have with um, Wheeland and Short in, their, in one of their, their premises is this idea of corporate repentance. And... I think the only thing that can really exist is individual repentance. Individuals can repent. Corporations cannot. But anyway, so we're going to go through these lessons that, that um, uh, Robert Olson talks about. So first, we must individually humble our souls before God and put away our idols. So... <clears throat> This, this important point, something that we should know, not just from the history of 1888, but it's something that I think definitely infects us. We have many idols, the things that we believe, that we trust in, that make us 
think we are better than others. And so we have to be able individually to humble our souls before God and put away our idols. To expect others to do so when we have not is unrealistic. Some have wondered whether the Seventh-day Adventist Church today should, in a general conference action, make a formal apology to the Lord for the sins of our brethren at Minneapolis. Ellen White recognized the responsibility of leadership in correcting evils and in setting a prop, the proper spiritual tone in the church. But in the 27 years she lived following Minneapolis meetings, she never once suggested that we should pass an official action in which we would formally dissociate ourselves from the unchristlike attitude manifested by so many at Minneapolis. She did, however, urge the individuals involved to confess their own sins. She warned the words and actions of all who took part in this work will stand registered against them until they make confession of their wrong. Repentance, she said, is the first step that must be taken by all who were to return to God. And no one can do this for another. We must individually humble our souls before God and put away our, our idols. So we're going to look at this more when we look at uh, 1888 reexamined. And this, this is something that I'm, I'm definitely not a fan of, of corporate repentance. Um, you know, we see this happening, well, at least in Canada. We, we've had to apologize, you know, for taking the land away from the natives and all the different things. We have the residential school system um, in, in Canada. And, and uh, so the media plays up on this. And, and somehow we have to make these official apologies from the government of Canada for things that it did to other people. I, I guess in the United States, you would have uh, public apologies to the Japanese for what happened during World War II. Um, after the bombing of uh, <clears throat> uh, in Hawaii there. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor right? Why, why, I mean, American they, Indians. That, that's kind of a, it's kind of background. They're backwards because What's, after the, how should we apologize to the Japanese after they bombed Pearl Harbor? What you're talking uh, about more is that an apology for, for how them after that. Right. Right. So how they, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So how they, we treated them after Pearl Harbor, because we basically imprisoned these people who are Americans <laughs> and had them on work camps and, and so forth. Um, because we were scared that they were going to uh, join the Japanese in an uprising against uh, their fellow Americans. Right. So that was what the apology was for. Yes, obviously not for, for the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor, but for how we treated the Japanese after that, American citizens. Um, now, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in, as individuals, we can make apologies. When governments make apologies, they're just really kind of meaningless gestures. Right? Right. <laughs> They don't really mean anything. They, they don't change any of the things that happen, and they don't change how governments act. Governments will still act in the way that they act. Uh, so, I mean, if individual people felt that they had wronged others, then they, they could apologize. But also, to apologize for something that I didn't do um, and that even my ancestors didn't do, you know, at least my direct ancestors that I know of, such as, you know, to apologize for the slavery in, you know, blacks in Canada. None of, none of my ancestors that I know of, because I researched my family tree, ever owned slaves. And as far back as I can tell, they were abolitionists. And, um, I mean, there might have been some ancestors who were prejudiced against blacks. I don't know. But I can't definitely apologize for them because I never participated in any of that. So I know in my immediate family, you know, definitely I was raised not to consider color or race. It just wasn't even talked about. It was just everybody was treated the same no matter who they were. So 
uh, for me to have to apologize, uh, I, I find that kind of wrong-headed. It doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, so, and, you know, I've been treated bad in some ways too, but I don't really expect, you know, other people to apologize for what their parents did or, you know, wouldn't make, it wouldn't make any difference to me. It wouldn't mean anything, but, but the idea here is that we need ourselves to repent for what we have done. Now, if we have participated in the same attitudes in as individuals, as those who opposed the message in 1888, then we can repent of that. Or if we recognize that we have a belief system individually that is contrary to God's message, we need to be corrected. But we can't take upon ourselves the guilt of those in the past and just make an apology for it. It doesn't, as, especially as a church, as an organization, doesn't really seem to make sense. Now, the idea there is that if the church would do this, then people would recognize, okay, we did something wrong then. But see, the church would say, we did something wrong then, but we, you know, we've made up for it already, right? So they're not going to, if they were to admit <coughs> that we have been teaching error ever since 1888 in regard to righteousness by faith, and that, you know, our official positions on this doctrine is skewed it's put in a language that's um makes it unintelligible uh to those seeking truth that actually weakens the message uh, i mean if they did that that would be good right but just to repent for something that happened in the past without any actual recognition that the church has not taught this message wouldn't be of any benefit, right? So if our leadership decided, you know, we were wrong. We were wrong in 1888. We're wrong today. We need to repent of our beliefs and change them, right? But since they already believe that they're, they're teaching what Jones and Wagner taught, they're teaching righteousness by faith, and that it's the same as what, you know, Martin Luther taught and, and you know the different reformers taught, and there's really no difference between our message and theirs. And, um, then you know a repentance, uh, an official um, corporate repentance in that sense wouldn't really do any good, right? So we need to recognize our individual responsibility, but we definitely can't recognize, uh, you know. We can't we can't repent of somebody else's sin. Even the church can't do that. Um, so the second point, he says, is we should pray without ceasing. We cannot afford to neglect our prayer life, even for a day. Elder C.C. McReynolds described the prayerless spirit at Minneapolis. In our lodging house, we were hearing a good many remarks about Sister White favoring Elder Wagner, that he was one of her pets. When the spirit of controversy was up. And when the delegates came in from the last meeting of the day, there was simply babble with much laughter and joking and some very disgusting comments were being made. No spirit of solemnity prevailing. A few did not engage in the hilarity. No worship hour was kept and anything but the solemnity that should have been felt and manifested on such an occasion was present. So anything but that solemnity was present. Now, I'm not here to sort of criticize other people. It's not, it's not the point of I'm better than someone else. But the one thing that I think that has been a casualty of Zoom, the Zoom studies and the Zoom prayer meetings and the Sabbaths, has been the irreverence that has been manifest pretty much from the start. So when we started keeping, uh, you know, having the Zoom meetings online, especially as we, we got to um, uh, the COVID pandemic and we're, we're going online to doing church. Um, there has been a lot of um, common talk and a lot of joking and jesting and also some very cruel comments about individuals, all kinds of gossip. And I have recordings of some of these things. 
because you know they would just record all day long and um i don't see very much difference in how um they acted in 1888 and the casualness with which we treat the study of god's word and especially on the sabbath and um i know i keep talking about how we're going to have a sabbath service at some point and i'm still trying to figure out how to do that a lot of things have come up and you know working out a number of different things but you know if we we're just going to have a, a sabbath service it always has to be done reverently and the idea of just keeping the zoom open up all day and you know sort of talking and i don't know what they, if they still do that but one of the things that i had difficulty with in um, going to the meetings on Sabbath was even the studies themselves uh, broke down into things that I would not call reverent. So when we study together, it needs to be done reverently, a respect for God's word, a respect for each other. And, you know, that's not always done. So, so we need to keep this in mind. And, and really, we should have, you know, reverence to God at all times. We should be acting in a reverent manner um, towards God and his word and towards his church and his people. Um, you know, to talk about people the way that we often do in gossip um, is should never occur, right? Um, so, so I think this is an important point. It's something that we have to guard ourselves against. We are of the world. We have an attitude like the world and we treat the Bible as a common thing. And it's not, it's God's word. Like even making jokes about scriptures or whatever, I don't think those things are appropriate. So, and, and we've all failed in that. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone in this regard. So because many didn't, delegates did not maintain a constant connection with God, the door was opened for Satan to control their thinking for a time. And we must not allow such a sad chapter to be repeated. And of course, since we're repeating Millerite history, we can be certain that those types of things, and not just Millerite history, but our, our own history, those types of things do occur. So third, and if anybody wants to comment on any of these things, feel free to do so. Third, we should learn to love all our brethren, including those who do not share our individual interpretations of scripture. Referring to Minneapolis, Ellen White lamented, the difference in the application of some few scriptural passages makes men forget their religious principles. Elements become banded together, exciting one another through the human passions to withstand in a harsh, denunciatory manner everything does that, that does not meet their ideas. This is not Christian, but is another spirit. She admonished the brethren A.T. Jones and Dr. Wagner. She admonished the brethren. A.T. Jones and Dr. Wagner hold views upon some doctrinal points which all admit are not vital questions. But it is a vital question whether we are Christians, whether we have a Christian spirit and are true, open, and frank with one another. Now, of course, these would be uh, there are some things that we discuss in, in scripture that we believe are important. That is, it's a view of scripture. Um, but what does it mean something is not vital? Are there things that we study, that we see, that we discuss, and that we have difference of opinions on, but they're not vital questions? Like, for instance, is it a vital question whether, um, you know, talking about his prince in Daniel chapter 11, um, one of his princes, that this is referring to one of Alexander's princes or to uh, one of um, Ptolemy's princes, so Seleucid, uh, saying that he's one of his princes? I don't know if it's a vital question. Um there's other things that we've studied. We've, we've, we've tried to weigh whether something is correct or not. And, and sometimes we're not certain. 
But sometimes, you know, we may have an opinion about the interpretation of the scripture. And if somebody opposes us, we're going to readily, you know, it'll get our dander up and we will start defending our position, something which we aren't even certain of, right? Just we're, It's just an opinion. And, and there are things that Jones and Wagner present. Sometimes it's a look, way to look at a particular verse or a way to look at um, some idea that they express. Maybe they're, they're correct, maybe they're not. Um, but definitely what is of more importance, what is vital, is whether we have a Christian spirit and are true, open, and frank with one another. Because if we are, we can come to a knowledge of the truth. If we aren't, it's very unlikely that we will come to a knowledge of the truth. The Law in Galatians and the Ten Kingdoms of Daniel 7 uh, were not vital questions, non-negotiables, such as the Sabbath in the investigative judgment doctrines. Now, and I would agree there, even though I believe the Law in Galatians um, is best understood as the, the moral law, that we are not under the condemnation of the moral law. Just because somebody doesn't understand that the way that I understand it isn't really ultimately going to affect their whole Christian life. But how I act in defending that, what I believe to be true, is. And just because that person has some wrong views, just because people hold some wrong views on certain things, is not going to affect their salvation in the long run. Obviously, the Sabbath, the investigative judgment, these are things as Seventh-day Adventists that we would call vital. They're vital questions. We need to understand them. But the details and some of our explanations around those things aren't vital. That is, our understanding is incomplete. Uh, they were in that class of biblical interpretations where some latitude of belief must be tolerated on issues that all agree are not vital. Is it right to be cool toward our brethren and sisters whose views are not identical with our own, to manifest an unchristlike spirit toward those in the church who differ with us on these or similar issues, is to repeat the spirit of Minneapolis. Just before the Minneapolis meeting, Ellen White exhorted the brethren, Heaven's enlightenment is what is needed, so that when we look upon the faces of our brethren, we may consider. These are they that have been purchased by the blood price of the blood of Christ. They are precious in his sight. I must love them as Christ has loved me. Surely this is good counsel for us today. Now I think back to um, the study where I uh, called uh, Mark Johnson. I didn't call him in uh, um uh, nonsense. I didn't say he, but I said what he was saying, his argument he was making was nonsense, which which I regret making that statement. And I apologized to him and everybody there at the time and even afterwards. Um, that was me getting caught up in what was happening. Now, I'm not making an excuse for it, but the reality is we had all made this mistake of having uh, that type of a discussion together as a group. That is uh, something where people were opposing sharply somebody's opinion. Now, people who remember that meeting, there was a discussion regarding amalgamation and what Ellen White means by it. And um, so the amalgamation of man and beast. And, and that was, there was other things that were being discussed, but that was really the main thing. And, and the question is, do we really know for certain what she was saying. Is that something to have a fight about? Is that something to treat somebody badly about? And so I can recognize the, how I acted in that discussion does not reflect good upon me or upon uh, you know, my, my, my character in how I acted that day. And so we have to recognize that but there were things that happened that lead to that, right? So we should never even create that environment and we should never attack anyone. And we can never make an excuse just because I felt attacked is no excuse for me to act in that way. 
But we know that all of us were involved in that issue, that none of us looked good in that discussion. Right. And, and we can say this here. The same happened with Jones and Wagner. As far as getting involved in the heat of this debate, they did things that took action, said words that they would regret, that they would have to repent of. Just because there was this attitude towards them does not excuse their response, right? So we can never say, well, I did it because other people were doing it, and so I'm not responsible. We have to recognize our responsibility in how we act. Nobody can make us act a certain way. We act those ways because we are not, uh, we're not Christ-like. That's why we act like that. So we have to repent of that and change. It's easy to say that somebody else should repent of it and change, but we need to. Okay. Now, the fourth point he wants us to look at, which I think is, I mean, it's its probably the most important, though you can't really say that none of these are, are not important, but we should sh search the scriptures for ourselves and not allow others to do our thinking for us. At Minneapolis, Ellen White could see that many of our ministers were simply following the leaders of Elders Butler and Smith in their understanding of scripture. They were not doing their own thinking, uh, their own thinking loyalty to, they were not doing their own thinking loyalty to leadership. I don't know if I understand that. The commendable virtue became a serious weakness when it led to following leadership blindly. I think there must be a period there. They were not doing their own thinking. Loyalty to leadership, a commendable virtue, became a serious weakness when it led to following leadership blindly. I think that makes more sense. On October 19th, Ellen White cautioned the delegates, do not believe anything simply because others say it is true. Take your Bibles and search for yourselves. Again, on October 24, she entreated, um, I want our young men to take a position, not because someone else takes it, but because they understand the truth for themselves. And on November 3rd, the last Sabbath of the conference, she wants more appeal to the brethren. We should be prepared to investigate the scriptures with unbiased minds, with reverence and candor. It becomes us to pray over matters of difference in views of scripture. The following day, November 4th, Ellen White wrote her daughter-in-law, the ministers have been the shadow and echo of Elder Butler. About as long as it is healthy, and for the good of the cause, Elder Butler thinks his position gives him such power that his voice is infallible. To get this off from the minds of our brethren has been a difficult matter. Let us not fall into the trap of putting any man where God should be. So now we know we've seen the party spirit in this movement. We've seen people follow different leaders, different speakers, and um you know, it's not that, you know, you have and people who were associated with Parminder are going to follow Parminder. You're not going to have many Parminder followers, you know, take that stand against Parminder when everything's happening there in um, on August 29th, 2019. I don't know how many people stood up against it. I mean, we know uh, there's a few. Um but people are going to follow their leaders. And, and so if we can't understand the scriptures for ourselves, and we're just going to go on someone else's coattails, we're in great danger. Now, um, there was another thought I had here. Um, okay. So, One one of the, the problems, I guess. So we we have we have this movement, you know, we had Future for America, with the School of the Prophets, and we had our own biblical research institute or 
it was called the doctrinal analysis group. Um, and we have organization. So we had organization. And we believe in order. We believe in organization, there, that the work should be organized, that things should be done decently and in order. That you just don't have every man just going off and doing what he's doing on his own. We need a united effort, right? And uh, we know that when it comes to doctrine, God's word is the standard. That we can't have any man or any committee of men uh, be uh, the authority above God's word. Right? Each person has to understand the truth for themselves. And this is a dynamic, a, a problem that, that, that is often difficult to resolve because when we had people teaching ideas that the movement didn't feel were correct, you know, that the doctrinal analysis group didn't approve of, though I don't know how that approval process worked because uh, there was no official voting on anything. So it was kind of a very strange, poorly organized doctrinal analysis group if it was supposed to be one. Um, uh, so, so we have this problem. So people think differently. How are you going to address that? Now, people can think differently and have some very, um, you know, their fruit is going to be manifested. My view is that when people have false doctrines that they are, are promoting, it will be also be demonstrated in their life. That the reason you don't disfellowship somebody for thinking something wrong right, in a church, you would disfellowship them for, for moral behavior, immoral behavior, right? And if somebody is thinking something that's incorrect, that's that's false, it will be manifested in their behavior. And mostly they will want to leave the church, right? So uh, to disfellowship them just over intellectual ideas alone, even if it's something that we might even think of as vital, there's approach that needs to be done in dealing with what we consider to be error. But we could see in the Millerite movement, they were much more open to allow differences of views and for people to consider those views on their own. So, I mean, obviously, if somebody's teaching outright heresy, they're probably not going to want to be associated with people who don't accept that message. So, so this whole idea that we, we also, not just that we need to study and investigate the scriptures for ourselves, but we need to allow others to do so, right? We need to allow others the freedom to study and, and to discuss those things. And if we do it correctly and, and they have a, a good attitude about it, people, you know, we can make, we can make it so we could push that person to the edge where they're going to act out because of how we treated them. But if we treat them correctly, even though they believe some things, even sometimes heretical things, I've some, seen people won over by how they were treated. I've also seen people driven further and further into heresy because of how they were treated. So, so this isn't just about us individually studying for ourselves. It's allowing others to study for themselves. It's sort of related to the previous one as well. Fifth, we should emphasize righteousness by faith in our preaching. We should make the subject as clear as crystal to our people, and we should be sure that we ourselves enjoy a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Ellen White urged, faith in Jesus Christ's righteousness in the behalf of every individual soul should be held before the people for their study and for them to contemplate thoroughly. This theme cannot be dwelt upon too often and too earnestly. So it's something that we need to study. It's an important doctrine, and it should be woven through our discourses, right? That Christ should always be upheld, and, um, and that we should point people to their need of Christ and trusting in his righteousness. Probably all the delegates at Minneapolis would have insisted that they believed in the doctrine of righteousness by faith in Christ. However, 
Many did not act or sound that way, either at the 1880 conference or in the months following. In addressing the 1888 general conference session, L. White stated, the true religion, the only religion of the Bible that teaches forgiveness through the merits of a crucified and risen savior, that advocates righteousness by faith of the son of God has been slighted, spoken against, ridiculed. It has been denounced as leading to enthusiasm and fanaticism. And that's still that, that um, accusation is, is still exists within the church. Even Uriah Smith's thinking on the subject appeared to have been fuzzy at times. For example, he editorialized in June 11, 1889 review, the law is spiritual, holy, just, and good, the divine standard of righteousness. Perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness. And that is the only way anyone can attain to righteousness. There is a righteousness which we must have in order to see the kingdom of heaven, which is called our righteousness, and this righteousness comes from being in harmony with the law of God. In Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25, we read, "Law, The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. The Lord would not command them to do what he had not made adequate provision for them to do. And if they did do it, it would be their righteousness. Now, you can see from what we've read by A.T. Jones, how this type of approach can be contrary to what Jones presented. Now, I don't know if I would actually completely disagree with what Uriah Smith writes here, because if it's well framed and understood, we, we can see, for instance, James, the Apostle James, and Paul. Are, are men justified by faith alone, or are they not? Are they in disagreement? Right? Paul says, man's justified by faith apart from the works of the law. What does James say? How does he put it? Man is not justified by faith alone, right? So he basically says the exact opposite. Are they in disagreement with, with each other? I got to find the statement. Are they in disagreement with each other? Well, I don't think they are because your faith is proven by your works. If your if your faith is centered on Christ, then you're going to do Christ like works, and that's what James is talking about. Yeah. So Galatians three eleven that no man is justified in the sight of God is is evident for the just shall live by faith. Let me see the statement. Uh, okay. So we got um, Romans three twenty eight. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, where James says, we see how that, uh, that by works is a man justified and not by faith only, right? So as we can say here, if we just looked at these things on the surface, we'd say they're in opposite camps, right? One believes that you're justified by works. The other believes you're justified by faith. Now, you could say, well, James says works and faith, because he says it's not by faith only. So you need some faith, but you also have to have works. But Paul is quite clear. Man is just by, by faith without the deeds of the law. And the deeds of the law, we would just equate with works. Right? Well, I say, think he's saying that the deeds of the law can't, if we're only trying to be legalistic, keeping the law to save ourselves, it's useless. But if, if we accept Christ as, as our Savior and seek to please him by obeying that law out of love and out of grace, that leads to us being saved. We cannot save ourselves no matter how good, quote unquote, we think we are. Right. So, so we understand that they're not in disagreement with each other. Okay. So sometimes when we when we frame things in language and we're trying to make a point on the surface, 
somebody could pick at our words and say, we're teaching something that we're not teaching. So, so James doesn't believe that man is justified by works. But he says, faith without works is dead, right? So, so if a man has faith, he will have works. So it's not really the works that justify him. He's justified by grace, actually, through faith, which worketh by love and purifies the soul. So man is really justified by God's grace. And in some way, you could not even, man's not really justified by faith unless you understand what is you're defining there. That is, man is, is saved by grace through faith. So faith is actually not how we are saved. It's not what we're saved by. It is something that connects us with God that allows us to experience his grace, right? So even our faith cannot save us, right? Because we, we can look at faith in different ways. The devils believe and tremble, right? So it has to be an act of living faith, a dependence and a trusting God instead of ourselves. But if we just trusted in God's righteousness, and never actually acted upon it, would we be justified? We would have to say no. No, that's yeah. what I was taught as, as a Roman Catholic. Jesus is right. so perfect. Mary is so perfect. Just concentrate on you can You can get their merits, you know, by performing sacrificial works and all this stuff, praying to the same. Forget it. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus. He's always with me. But the main point here is that we can see that people can be, they, they can express themselves in ways uh, that they don't fully understand the significance. Because I don't believe um, that people fully understand, well, probably anything. We never fully understand anything. But there is much that we need to learn about righteousness by faith as a doctor. And definitely, um, we can see that there are many different ideas about righteousness by faith that we've heard from the pulpit, that we've read in books. For instance, I was mentioning, I said Alex Ortega, but it's actually Jack Sakira that I was thinking of, who wrote the book Beyond Belief. I was mentioning it last week. It's a good place to mention it. So here we have somebody who professes to believe Jones and Wagner's material. He's part of the 1888 Message Study com Committee. But he teaches a doctrine that is wrong, right? That is, he teaches that, that all men are justified. Now, he, you could say, you know, Christ died for all men. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he died for the unrighteous. But justification is more than just what God has done. That there is a part that man plays in responding to that. And, and those differences, the way that we describe these things, and there's all these technical terms, you know, forensic justification, you know, legal justification, all these different types of views that people have, and they try to define things in the scripture. What we have to do is we have to understand what, what God is saying to us individually because a person may not be able to express correctly the ideas about righteousness by faith, but he can experience it without understanding it, right? I would say, yeah. yeah. You know, we may not know, you know, what the right words to say. We may read something and get from it different than what other the other person intended, but if a person has called upon God and asked God to take over their life and they're trusting in God to work in them and they want to cooperate with God in that work, they are experiencing justification by faith. They're, they, they're at peace with God. They may not understand it. You know, we don't need to understand what fire is and how it works in order to use a fire, right? Many people have lit a fire and have no idea what fire is, right? You don't need to know how a car works in order to drive it. 
right? So you don't need to fully understand everything about justification and sanctification and so forth in order to experience it. But if you do experience it, God will give you an understanding of it, a practical understanding that you can share with others. You can share your experience. What you experienced was righteousness by faith. When you share that with someone else and you have experienced God's you know, forgiveness and his power is working in your life, you may not express it clearly enough for a theologian, but you know what it is. Now, when Jones and Wagner were presenting their message, part of the problem that we have and that we need to, to study and understand is um, there's this idea that there's this, we talked about it before, this ephemeral idea of what the, mess, the 1888 message was. And, and people have different views on it, right? So the people will read Jones and Wagner and Jack Secura will say what he thinks that message was and, and I'll read it and I'll have my view and somebody else reads it and somebody has another view and we, we start to compare notes and we, you know we disagree with them something about what Jones says about the nature of Christ um, or what Wagner says about Christ's divinity or different things like this, right? So, you know, the question is, is it just that people don't understand that message that Jones and Wagner presented? If we can just get that message to them, then all of a sudden they're going to have this understanding. How, how does that come about? How do we address these differences like i believe there are things that people miss in jones and wagner's presentation that 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 the, the message has become obscured through the years of the controversy so that the message is actually not very accessible to the average adventist today because the meanings of the words have changed the 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 rhetoric and the dialogue uh, 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 you know the the definitions of these words have, have changed in such a way that when a person, they've already had their minds biased to see things a certain way, and so they can't see it, right? So anyway, um, a week after this editorial was published, someone asked Ellen White, what does Brother Smith's piece in the review mean? She responded publicly, he doesn't know what he is talking about. He sees trees as men walking. It is impossible for us to exalt the law of Jehovah unless we take hold of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? So I believe that, that Smith does not understand what he is saying. That is, he, he doesn't understand the doctrine of righteousness by faith when he writes this. And yet he's using some scriptures, which when I read these scriptures, I can agree with it on one level, but I can see that he's missing the boat, right? He's missing the point of what was being taught at Minneapolis. In a manuscript, looking back at Minneapolis, written a few weeks after the conference closed, Ellen White stated, I bore testimony that the most precious light had been shining forth from the scriptures in the presentation of the great subject of the righteousness of Christ connected with the law, which should be constantly kept before the sinner as his only hope of salvation. It is a study that can tax the highest human intelligence that man, fallen, deceived by Satan, taking Satan's side of the question, can be conformed to the image of the Son of the infinite God, that man shall be like him, that because of the righteousness of Christ given to man, God will love. God will love man, fallen but redeemed, even as he loved his Son. This is the mystery of godliness. This picture is of the highest value. It is to be meditated upon, placed in every discourse, hung in memory's hall, uttered by human lips, and traced by human beings who have tasted and known that the Lord is good. It is to be the groundwork of every discourse. So uh, definitely Uriah Smith is missing something. Right. He's missing something about what was said. And that's partly because of the party spirit that had happened. So 
So when you have somebody write something, because because the one thing I'm saying is that, let's look at it this way. Would Paul and James, if they got together, been arguing about righteousness by faith because they wrote and expressed it in a different way? Would James have disagreed with Paul and would Paul have disagreed with James? I don't think so, no. Uh, yeah. They would have sat mm -hmm. down and, and talked about it, I'm sure. But... Yeah, and I think they would have understood what the other one was saying. Yeah. Now, here we have Uriah Smith presenting something really in opposition to what was being taught at Minneapolis, right? That is, he can't see that what Jones and Wagner were presenting were, was precious truth because he's caught up in this idea, uh, you know, whatever it is, that he, how he sees things. And I don't think that would have been the case with James and Paul. No. Uh -huh. Okay. Sister White could hardly have expressed herself more plainly and more decidedly than when she said, the point which has been urged upon the minds for years, my mind for years, is the imputed righteousness of Christ. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so Jones' statement leans in that direction. But it's not just that it leans in that direction. It's rejecting the light that came from Minneapolis. So no way would the Apostle James be saying salvation isn't through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He would just recognize that faith in Jesus Christ produces works. It works. Faith works by love. It works. It's not just, you know, you trust in what Jesus did and nothing happens. But Paul is emphasizing the fact that our works cannot save us. It's our faith that saves us. And James would not disagree with that. Okay, sixth. <clears throat> um, we should despise not prophesies. If Uriah Smith had only heeded this admonition at Minneapolis, he would have saved himself and many others much heartache. But the devil convinced Smith that Ellen White had contradicted herself. She had told J.H. Wagner, Wagner in the 1850s that his view on Galatians 3 was wrong. Now in 1888, she appeared to support the younger Wagner, who had essentially the same view as his father. Actually, Ellen White did not take a position on Galatians 3 at the Minneapolis conference. She carefully avoided taking sides on this issue. She pointed out, in fact, that her understanding of this passage was different in some respects from that of Dr. Wagner. But Smith was not listening. He allowed himself to brood over what he thought were Ellen White's mistakes. His coolness towards God's prophet continued for more than two years. Finally, on January 7th, 1891, he made a full confession. Of this, Ellen White wrote, Brother Smith took my hand as he left the room. And I said, if the Lord will forgive me, and said, if the Lord will forgive me for the sorrows and burdens I have brought upon you, I tell you this will be the last. I will stay upon your hands. It is seldom that Elder Smith sheds a tear, but he did weep, and his voice was choked with the tears in it. This temporary rejection of the prophetic voice was harmful, not only to Smith's Christian experience, but to the confidence of others as well. Ellen White reminded him that he could not recall the ever-extending consequences of his influence, but he couldn't retract them. She appealed, after your course of action has unsettled the minds and faith in the testimonies, what have you gained? If you should recover your faith, how can you remove the impressions of unbelief you have sown in other minds? How much better for us to be immovable in our acceptance of the evidence God has given that Ellen White was his prophet. So obviously, this is important to believe the spirit of prophecy. Um, but also the, the putting of doubt upon God's message and messengers, not just Helen White, um, is not of God. And so this 
what he did with Ellen White was a result of an attitude that he had about himself. Seventh, let us maintain our confidence in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, this is the church organization referred to in Revelation 12, 17. There is no other. Even though Ellen White entertained doubts about this fact at Minneapolis, she did not entertain those doubts for long. Before she left that city, she wrote to me, I tremble to think what would have been in this meeting if we had not been here. God would have worked in some way to prevent this spirit brought, in, brought to the meeting, having a controlling power. But we are not the least discouraged. We trust in the Lord God of Israel. The truth will triumph, and we mean it, mean to triumph with it. Throughout the rest of her life, Ellen White continued to sound the same note of confidence in the Advent movement. Now, he's done a little bit of what I would call um, a bait and switch. So is there a difference between the Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization and the Advent movement? Yeah, there are differences, yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't, yeah, I don't, I mean, obviously, <laughs> we can see that the church, the, the books of a new order, and the disorganization, the new organization that resulted, um, has to be considered. But we have to consider that, um, though there are many good Adventists who trust in the spirit of prophecy, that the movement, the, the, the Advent movement has diversified and split so that we can hardly recognize in the Seventh-day Adventist Church of today much that is similar to the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the past. Not really moving. Yeah. So, really so the organization it's itself... Moved. Yeah. So the organization itself, I don't think, is is the issue, but we should maintain our confidence in God's leading of his church. When I say the church, not the Seventh-day Adventist or church organization, but of the seven, because we are Seventh-day Adventists. We're not going to be given some other name. We're going to be recognized as Seventh-day Adventists, even if the church doesn't recognize us. Right? Amen. So we are Seventh-day Adventists, and even if the church doesn't allow us to call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists, we are, right? So um, so her uh, showing the na same note of confidence in the Advent movement in the 1890s, kingly power in our general conference administration drew from her scathing words. The voice of Battle Creek is no longer the voice of God. Uh, the church is in the Laodicean state. The presence of God is not in her midst. Um, so this is, a, you know, quite a topic. You know, we we're not really addressing this topic in in any kind of detail. Um, but I think it's something that we have to recognize that God is going to be victorious, that his ch church will stand. Because Ellen White says, company after company, our tribe after tribe will leave us. No, it's the other way. Company after company leaves us, and tribe after tribe will join us. So we're going to see a dissolution of what, because people say if you stay with the ship, you know, you're saved. But that ship is not is not our safety. The truth is our safety. Christ is our safety. Because there isn't going to be a ship to stay with. And, and we've talked about this before. If the church supports the Sunday law, they're no longer Seventh-day Adventists. But if they oppose it, will the state, the government, allow the Seventh-day Adventist church as an organization to continue? No. Right? Nope. So at the end, we know we're not going to be able to look to an organization to guide us. And we're going to have many, many different voices. We're going to hear from our own pulpits, from the hellish tor torch of false prophecy, urging upon us the necessity of observing the first day of the week. And so people are going to have to make their individual choices. So 
So this is just the way it is. We, we support God's church if it is doing God's will. You can't support a church that's not doing God's will, that is opposed to the truth. So it, it's something each of us as individuals has to decide, our relationship with the church. On a local level, we could have a good relationship with the church. We can have a good church. But as far as the whole organization is concerned, we can't just blindly put our trust in that organization. And we can't expect that the organization has to be redeemed because one of the problems that uh, Jeff had with the 2520 was, um, you know, there was people back in 2010, I remember when I went to Oklahoma, and there was people talking about, okay, we got to go to the church leaders. we got to get the church to see our point. And Jeff was just like, no, you're wasting your time. You know, you don't need to go to the leadership and get their approval. You just present the truth. The, the individual members of the church have to decide for themselves what is truth. So trying to convince leadership of the truthfulness of the 2520 or any sort of reform in doctrine or understanding you can deal with an individual. I mean, if you have an opportunity to talk to somebody and he's an individual and he happens to be a pastor or a conference president or, you know, some other official in the church, sure, share with him. But the idea that we we have to do this, that we have to go to the leadership and convince them of the correctness of our position is wrong because they are not going to accept the truth. The church is not going to accept it. And we just, we have to accept that fact, right? But individuals will. Okay. That's my view on that point. Okay. So we took up a lot of more time than I thought we would reading these uh, seven lessons to learn. Any, any thoughts on, on this? I mean, because generally I can agree with the, the tenor of this paper. Um, of course, I like Robert Olson, but as uh, you know, from the EG by the States, he wrote a lot of good things. Um, but I still think there are points that, that we're going to have to look at more closely. Um, and so, so we're going to look at, so next time, I think what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at the article in ministry magazine, which won't take long about the 1888 um, uh, re-examined book. And then we're going to have to look at some of that book, some of the basic ideas there. You had a, you had a thought there, Jeff? Is that you? Well, you no, no. Uh -uh. I, know. I thought somebody was trying to talk. Somebody else, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would like to say that what really stood out to me is when she said, it's impossible for us to exalt the law of Jehovah unless we take hold of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is so deep. And I mean, I can meditate on that for quite some time. Like, how can we exalt his law? We have to live his law. And how can we live his law unless we have a really close relationship with him? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you can't put the cart before the horse. I mean, you, you know, obedience to the law can't save you, right? Because you're a sinner. You need the righteousness of Christ. You need is imputed and imparted righteousness. Amen. And, uh, and that's his righteousness. Now, in a certain sense, we can say it's our righteousness because Christ gave it to us. But we don't recognize it as our righteousness because our righteousness is filthy rags. And if we start thinking of that, our, that we're somehow have our own righteousness, I mean, this is what Parminder's movement was teaching, <laughs> basically. That, you know, that they weren't sinning anymore because now they understood right. And of course, uh, you know, it wasn't something that everybody picked up on, but me talking to individuals who were, and I just thought, well, you know, why are these people believing that Parminder's teaching that, you know, especially early on? But as time went on, I started to realize that's what he was teaching um, and had to do with his nature of man. So he was decompartmentalizing 
um, what sin was. It was very dangerous teaching. So the thing is, we're on this path of, of studying this history. So I know it's it's not simple. Um, you know, the view that there is some sort of 1888 message that, you know, we just have to get the right words and then we have this message. Um, people arguing and fighting over, you know, exactly what the 1888 message is without actually depending upon Christ alone for our righteousness um, really doesn't benefit, benefit us at all. But we do want to have a correct understanding of these things. We do need to study them. And, you know, my study and understanding of righteousness by faith has grown over the years. You know, in some ways it's, it's, um, it's become a bit more basic, more simplified uh, than it used to be because I was caught up in a lot of these, you know, niceties, the fine details of trying to understand things. And sometimes got a little, little off course in that way. Um, but, you know, it's something you have to do. You have to uh, grapple with these concepts and ideas and fit them into your experience. But that experience should show us that we are sinners and that Christ is righteous. And it should uh, result in a dependence upon Christ so that we actually will display righteousness to the world, even if we ourselves cannot perceive it. Right? And this to me is one of the, the fundamental principles of righteousness by faith that we see in Jones' writings and Wagner's writings that is often missed, is that Christ's, Christ did not see himself as righteous. He didn't use his own righteousness, but he had the righteousness, which is by faith, his righteousness was his father's righteousness given to him. That's what he depended upon, not what he saw in himself. And so that's to be our experience. And so that's you know why we're studying this. But we also see that there's a prophetic element to these messages as well. That not just the third angel's message is righteousness by faith, but the first two steps are essential parts of righteousness by faith. It's just the third angel's message is when we have the seal of God and we can go through that uh, the test, Sunday law test, go through the Sunday law. Um, that's when righteousness is now fully revealed. Christ's character is seen upon his people. All of those things that are the purpose of, of this three-step testing prophetic message. Okay, any other thoughts? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we had here this evening. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, you can be with us tomorrow morning in the study. That um, help people to re remember if there's with the time change. Um, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, the things that we study in our personal life will bring us closer to you. Help us to see our need of you the trials and difficulties we faith we face lord we ask ask for the faith to trust in you in spite of what we see we know lord it's it's very very difficult being a christian we know that this world is not our home that uh, we often get caught up in the things of this world we ask lord that we can cling to you to your hope and promises that you can deliver us from this present evil world. So we trust in you, pray for one another. We ask that you can use us to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name.